recording so you can start the guy okay thank you very much Deja. you're welcome so today we're going to do a spring refresher on field climate tools and of course solutions it's all about solutions uh, i'm guy ash i'm the global training manager for pestle and key accounts manager in canada so i'm going to give you an overview of a few slides uh, talk about some of the key solutions inside field climate and then a, a live demo of these things so we got quite a bit to cover uh, at any point in time you know as Nez is saying there's a recording to go back on or you can communicate directly with me in email and I can provide you uh, content as well so we've been in the business a long time we've got a lot of partners involved in uh, different walks of life of this business from sensors to telecommunication industry interface partners a whole host of them it's still an issue today for many people on farm that they're getting too much information too many ways i have farmers burning through batteries four times a day on a small on a smartphone because you know there's just so many apps so where it's all headed is to a data insight type system where uh, you get a lot of information collected a lot of science to it but very simple ways of viewing the answer to a problem and i like to say that as data insight or a stoplight approach green good yellow caution red stop so that's the goal the ultimate goal uh, with any of these type of solutions today uh, that are from a field so <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of uh, tools in uh, our decision support system and there's a value proposition for them so today I want to discuss things like field specific data which is just things like temperature and precip the ability to alert on these things for management decisions on the fly, the field specific uh, forecasting and work planning tools, things like sowing or spraying windows that come because of a very uh, accurate uh, forecast for your field, the uh, monitoring for insects and diseases. We have 80 different models for over 40 crops that are available. I mean, of course, we're not going to go through all of them. We have a series of cheat sheets that help with this, which you'll see. We've added a yield prediction and satellite solution as well, based on crop zones or a field uh, that you want to set up called FarmView. And of course, irrigation and soil moisture monitoring. And all that does, all these tools are about the optimization of inputs, you know, improving the quality and yield of your crop. And we're doing that through timely management throughout the year of all these things below, which is, of course, ultimately reducing the risk and improving uh, the ROI for a particular crop or problem. So there's a lot of uh, different solutions that are available to us today. And again, make the point that it's a nested approach. It's not one solution fits all. Many people will gravitate to a weather station in a field, but there are many different devices that can be used for a variety of things. You don't need the same thing for every solution. You may only need a small in-field monitor for temperature and precip and humidity for disease management to a full weather station with wind speed or camera products for looking at you know insects or pictures of phenology of a crop. So there's a variety of products that are used uh, for the nested IoT approach. With that, there's a hardware portfolio of many different devices from virtual stations to entry level, uh, very little flexibility kind of solid state stations under the nano metos title. More flexible being the micro metos that allows different sensors attached to it to the fully optimized and flexible station which has the capability of connecting up to 400 different types of sensors not all at one time and even golf type applications that are buried underneath the turf for monitoring very uh, specific applications then you get into other things like the camera products for insects or camera looking at crop phenology uh, work track and beacons uh, some of the automation uh, we have you know now a sole antenna for looking at the quality of a product and storage like potatoes onions sugar beets things like that or even specific types of uh, spray type stations so there's a variety of technology that can be used and as I'm saying there's a variety of solutions that apply to any customer it's not one that fits all you may only want precip so you only get precip on a station or you may want a fully flexible device that has everything on it 
then you need an IMATOS 300 with ultrasonic wind speed direction and everything in between. So we'll talk about some of these today in the different solutions that we are going to show you here. So this is the hardware part. Of course, there is the software part that's very important as well. To make that happen, you need to have sensors for these variety of solutions. So, you know, there's a whole host of different sensors that can be applied to a station, it's standard rain, wind speed, wind direction, temp, humidity, leaf wetness, probes of various different uh, depths and measuring different characteristics, things like uh, frost, so wet bulb, dry bulb temperature, or a one individual probe for soil moisture, soil temperature at one depth, solar radiation, and everything else in between. So there's lots of different sensors that are connected. The key is that all these have to connect, and today in the world there's a lot of adjustment in any country on network capability. A lot of it to date has been a lot of the GSM LTE type networks which we're under we're getting a push to 5g today uh, today there's a lot of work in the narrowband iot or ltem cad m1 type space it seems to be the way for most of the devices that we have because it's lower cost and smaller packets of data and has better distance than some of the standard type lte networks so that's the solution if you're using a camera product you still have to use LTE because of the packet size you're dealing with imagery that are fairly large. So all these things need to be connected and today there is a good push on for lower cost, better distance type solutions through the narrowband IoT connectivity. There is a value proposition for all of this. I want to be clear about that and it's a stacked ROI. When we think of these things we have a tendency to think about it for one, one purpose but I want to always be clear that there's a set of actional sol solutions that come off of any device and not one. So we're going to talk about them. So you can look at real-time conditions. You can set alerts on a device. You can have a site-specific sp hourly forecast with work planning tools. You can have a whole host of different crop and insect models available to you. You have the yield prediction and satellite uh, farm zone type application, crop zone type application and of course the all important irrigation management that comes with it so all those are part of what i call multiple or stacked roi and they're broken out into each one of these sheets these sheets are available if you want them as well with your own branding for your own application we also then like to make this a lot simpler than it has been so i you know we've created these cheat sheets that are easy to use and as they show here as an example you know, if you're using fusarium in wheat, here's the steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you're choosing your device, choosing your model, choosing your time period, and viewing the graph. And what does all that mean? So that's a quick uh, cheat sheet, as I like to call it, for any one of these solutions I'm going to show you today. So there's some on frost, for example, monitoring for extreme weather. There's one on the whole mobile application. And there's lots of other ones uh, that we have as well. So at this point, I'll just switch over to the actual live demo. So when you come in, I'm logged into Field Climate. Uh, I have my, my dashboard up in front of me. My dashboard has a map, and below it has uh, a number of different devices. I, of course, can drill into whatever station I want to look at uh, very quickly and click on that particular device, and it'll take me to that device. So now I'm into the centric data for the station. I can also do that the other way over here by clicking on the station list and dropping down and picking my station. So I'm on a station at my yard. I can see that it has an icon for disease models on and an icon for forecast, whereas other ones may just have disease or some have nothing on them. So this is your pick list and you can search by station in there. Before we go into more detail here, under the user menu, it's important for you to know that your add remove stations happens here. So if you want to add a station to your account, you do that by setting it up and the station name and key that's provided. If you want to see what licenses you have turned on, we now have a list of that in front of you. So you know when they're run and when they expire, that's available to you. The user settings are important because you can change your password at any point in time. You can also then put in your information, 
what units you want to look at. So I'm working in metric here, and I will convert that to imperial because I can do that uh, based on my background of being around a long time, knowing both units. So, and you can get updates. So, you know, it's important to look at your user profile every so often. There's feedback and support in here in addition. So if we go back to a station and pick a station, as I said, in front of you, what happens is you get a graph. It's a two-day graph, and you can pick what data you want. So if you wanted to pick raw, you could pick raw and click refresh, and that gives you not only the hourly data, but how the data was captured. So it's captured in 15-minute time steps, the logging, and you can see all that data plotted out in front of you. You see your other variables below, like sunshine, your, in this case, leaf wetness, humidity, delta T, all your winds, wind speed direction, gusts, your ETO, important figure of solar panel and battery to see how the station's doing. And on this one, it has a probe for soil moisture, uh, volumetric ion content, and soil temperature down to 90 centimeters or three feet. So all that's pre presented in front of you. You can also see below the table of data and it'll break it out even in terms of max, min, and average in addition. So there's lots of data that's available and each one of these variables can be used in specific ways. Uh, so things like the dew point is an important part of uh, frost prediction. So knowing the dew point the night before, if you have a dew point below freezing, yeah, but the air temperature is still 45 or seven degrees Celsius, something like that, but the dew point says minus one or 30 Fahrenheit, you can be assured if it's a clear night without cloud, the next day the likelihood of frost will happen. So dew point alone by itself has uh, uses uh, in things like frost prediction. It's one tool in the, in the toolbox. You can turn any of these on or off by clicking on the legend here. Um, you can do that over here as well. So on the left side, we have a, the name of the station, all the, the variables with it, and then the sub nodule, nodule for the probe, which lists all the different uh, measurements that are made at different depths. In this case, uh, every 10 centimeters down to 90 centimeters. You can quickly uh, zoom in if you want on an area. So I've zoomed in in a period. I can reset that zoom uh, by clicking here as well. At any one point in time, you can export this as an Excel file or you can save it as an image file to send, send it to someone. So that's all available just in the data side. After that, I like to go down to the device settings and then the device settings, there are a number of things here to uh, look at and pay attention to. One is the configuration. So at any point in time, you can change the name of your device. So I have this called PESEL Winnipeg. I can see on the map where it's located. It gives me my lat long based on a manual input or uh, the GPS from the unit. I can save notes on it as well. And if you're a key one uh, access to a station, you can set the logging interval and the transfer interval for the station, or you can do it hourly by selecting all. The key is that the logging interval needs to be less than the transfer interval in this case. So I have it logging every 15 minutes in this case and transferring data every 30 minutes. So that's a configuration of it. The sensors and nodes gets into the actual individual uh, setup of each sensor. So here you can see the code of it. Uh, it's active, solar radiation, and the units that it's in. So many people uh, still even in Canada don't like millimeters so they may want to put it in inches so you could change that to inches and you could say precip in inches so you could give it a custom name if you wanted to you can do that and you can change the color code of how it's shown on the graph so every one of these for example vpd doesn't mean much but what it means is vapor pressure deficit so that's spelled out as a username custom name and then in the probe we have a centec here so every 10 centimeters there's a reading well it doesn't mean much unless I know what it is. So I've said soil moisture 10 centimeters down to 90 or from right from zero, four inch, two and a half inch down to uh, about uh, three feet down. So that's all available. And when you make changes, you have to save all the sensor changes. Now, what you can do when you have the data is set uh, a warnings. So there's two ways to set warnings in here. One is the SMS that comes directly from the station. 
So the station is smart. It can store a number of phone numbers and send direct SMS messages to you on your uh, smartphone. So you can put in the uh, phone, the name of the person, and have it uh, active or non-active or remove it. And then you can add a number of people here. I think I don't know the exact number up to, maybe up to up to 10. I have to clarify that. And then you can pick what sensor you want to be uh, warned on. So you can say precip, and you can put in a minimum warning, a maximum warning. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one value, like here on air temperature. So I have it set at 210, which is, you know, 35 degrees, 33, 34 degrees, and then freezing, as an example. So you can have multiple uh, thresholds in any one of these as well. And they can be decimal values as well. So it could be 1.5 as an example. And those then will be sent uh, to your phone uh, based on an SMS. So you got to make sure you know, when you deal with this, you have enough SMS messaging on the station SIM as well. Your plan that you have on your phone can handle SMS you know, without incurring more cost to be aware of it. If you don't want to use that, then you can use the web notification which is more going through the web. So here, it's the same type of thing. You can set up any type of threshold you want. So you could say precip above a value, put in 25 millimeters or an inch, resend after one hour. I could put in my email, and then I could say I want it active on my mobile uh, platform, Android or iOS. So if you say yes, any alert that you set below, then, becomes active and can be sent to your mobile and what you get is this little notification icon so on the desktop you see it here but on your mobile uh, smartphone you'll see this as well so what happens is it'll list each one of the uh, alerts that have happened in the history uh, here but also on the android or ios app and you can uh, customize that uh, to how you want as well on the iOS or Android. So you can make adjustments to these thresholds if you'd like. So you can set anything you want. If you want ultrasonic wind speed above a threshold, you know, send it to my mobile only. This one I have email, email, email or mobile, and I have it active. So you can turn them on or off, and you can set that up um, for any one of the variables. So powerful tools for alerting. So for spraying, if you want to know wind speed above a threshold or gust availability of how high it's gusting in an area or how much precip fell, all those are customizable. The other thing to pay attention to here is the information that's available. So under information, this is where you can see when the station last communicated. That's important. That's in front of you when it was created. All the IDs on the station that are important, the firmware version we may ask for the cellular provider. There's even station communication in here. So if you click that, it'll tell you the communication time to, and if it was successful, that's available to you in addition. Delete weather data, I would not recommend doing this. Uh, be very cautious because if you do, you delete data, it's gone. So you have to be very specific in doing that. Most people don't uh, do that. If they are, they usually look for some help on it. The one that can be used that's nice is the correct precipitation. So in this case, if something was plugged in your bucket or it tipped too many times because of you know moving it, you can actually go in and set the value correct. Uh, so if there was no precip and the station was being moved and it tipped, well, then you can minus it out from it. Or if you have uh, a virtual station and you want to actually put in uh, measurements from a manual gauge, you can do that as well by using this tool. So it's a nice little new tool addition. So that's a quick run through of the device settings. After that, you get in, as I said now, in the forecast section, <clears throat> when you have that icon and that turned on for your station, it shows up, as I said, over here, you can then have a whole series of powerful tools. So now we have the precip, temperature, wind speed, wind direction, all these variables hour by hour, updated hourly for the next seven days in front of us, and you can scroll across, across them. So now it's telling me over the next while, there's 22 millimeters of rain, so just under an inch of rain from my location and my temperatures. 
So this is the detailed forecast, and this detailed forecast gets built into, which I'll describe in a bit minute, called work planning tools. We do have some summary type forecasts in here, like a Meteo 1, which is just the standard type six hour update, kind of pictorial layout of what's gonna happen in terms of cloud, winds, and temperature. If you wanna break it out uh, by variable for every six hours, you get the agro, Meteo agro forecast, which shows temperature, then it shows precipitation, clouds, it has a little spray calculator, uh, spray window uh, in it. It has evapotranspiration, wind speed, wind direction. So that's there. If you want the picto print, that goes down to a three hour time step and shows you where the rain will fall in relation to that device. So that's there as well and the probability and the amount of precipitation. So the one, and then uh, going to a medium range forecast, which is out 14 days, it allows you to see temperatures, what they'll do over the next 14 days, uh, max min and precip and probability. And of course the error bars get more as you go out further with forecasting. First seven days is much more accurate than the next seven days. The key here is that this forecast is built for your device. So the device is contributing data to nudging, nudging and tuning the forecast. And there's AI, artificial intelligence built in that learns the climate and weather at that spot and fine tunes then the forecast model for that location. So what does all that mean? You're assured of a very accurate site specific forecast for that location with the station running properly with the necessary sensors and the forecast tuned. We also added a while ago some information on weather maps. So in here you can uh, quickly look at radar. So you can see there's uh, precip proceeding across my area where I am. You can actually go out in the future with this future forecast where it'll be. You can add on things like wind animation. So if you wanna see the animation of wind, uh, the flow of wind over that area, that's available to you. If you want the weather warnings official, so we see that we're under a haze advisory, special air statement because of forest fires, wildfires in Canada. They're all there for all across the continent in front of you. If you want the forecast ones from our forecast models, then we break it out uh, as well. So we can see there's some wind gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour down in North Dakota. So you can have all that in front of you as well as part of the weather map product. The one that we added recently is this history and climate, which is pretty a uh, cool thing because what it does is, is it allows you to look at the, the risk in terms of cold events, warm events, and precip. So here, this is an event of less than one degree or about 33 and a half degrees Fahrenheit for one hour. So what's the likelihood of that occurring where we are in May you know, for on a, on a day average, it's down around 20, 25%. Uh, in a week, it's maybe a little bit later into June that still can occur. And then you can actually look at the risk that you're comfortable with for that type of event if you have seeded and the, and the crop has germinated. The other nice thing is it breaks it out over the last 35 years, how that's stacked up year by year. So where we are, the last three years have been actually a cool spring because of a La Nina event. So we've had later frost events and you can see how that fluctuates through time and kind of where the last events took place. So we were, you know, in 2021, we were almost out to June where we had an event of that cool. And on the other end, you can see the, the chance of the first fall kind of cool temperature. So you can do that for anything. You can do that for the warm events in front of you. How many days are above 86 Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius when they occur? the risks of that weekly, daily, and when they actually occurred, uh, when were they over the last 35 years? So it's a good tool. We do that for precipitation in addition. So you can look at the precipitation events as they occurred over time, when the bulk of rain more than an inch and a quarter or 30 millimeters occurred uh, over the period of time, the risk of that happening, you know, 25%, and the breakout of that day by day uh, over the last 35 years. So a very powerful stack of tools, again, in the forecast section. They get built into the work planning tools. Once you have that, 
now you have a set of work planning tools for plant nutrition, field accessibility, tillage ability, sowing, spraying, and harvest. So when you get the forecast, you get the work planning tools. So I can click on here and say, okay, what's my sowing conditions for corn uh, where I am based off of uh, two things, the data from the station. So it's looking at, so this is uh, happening in the next hour and everything before that is used to calculate the soil temperature you need and precipitation amounts. So it's saying conditions are, in this case, we have a scale, which is maroon being the worst, uh, you know, one or and kind of a beige color eh, okay and then green very good so it color codes that based on the conditions for sowing for that crop and they'll change slightly based on the type of crop you have so we see some conditions in here that are not the best soil temperature cools down because the air temperatures get cooler and then it improves back up to very nice soil temperatures for corn seeding and germination so that's an hour by hour window based off of that site specific forecast for that device and updated hourly uh, for that period of time for the next seven days. So the next is spraying. We've kind of come up with a, a new spray window, which is more of the international standard now. And it's color coded again through maroon through green. And you can see above the colors change for the variables. So in this, there's a number of variables. There's delta T, which is the survivability of the droplet once it leaves a spray boom. And that really is governed by temperature and humidity. So you usually spray between two and eight or two and 10. Uh, so we're at 11. The wind gust is a little high and the humidity is low. So that's why. Wind gust is marginal, humidity is out of range and delta T is out of range. Over here, the wind speed is low. It's too low for spraying. When you have a low wind speed, of course, you could have drift because particulates will drift uh, unpredictable uh, in a situation where you can get a temperature inversion. So that, again, is an hour-by-hour hour forecast for spraying built off of that site-specific uh, forecast for your given field. The, the next thing I'll look at is the accumulation tool. So here you can actually look at calculating your heat units for a particular crop. So if I just took April, April 1st till today, I took an air temperature sensor. I could do this for soil temperature if I wanted to, whatever. Pick a base of five, an upper threshold of 30. So every crop has different bases. So corn is 10 Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit. And the upper limit on corn would be 86 to 90. Above that, you get some uh, a bit of heat stress on it. So typically the range for that, and we can do calculate. And what you get then is your curve of heat units uh, for that particular base and upper threshold. And there's two different ways of calculating. So in Europe, they calculate it slightly different than we do in North America, which is the max min divided by two from the base. And below is a table of all those values as well, uh, calculated in front of you. There's things in here for chilling units. So if you're in um, the horticulture, grape, apple industry, you can use that as well to make uh, different chilling models that are available uh, for calculation and hardening off in the fall or in the spring. You can use it to calculate the amount of rain as well in there. Uh, one of the new products that we did add recently is our extreme weather monitoring section. So in here, uh, if you have a wet bulb and dry bulb temperature, so right now on this station, I simply have an air temperature. I don't have wet bulb and dry bulb, so I should pick a station that has that. So if I look at this station here, I have that on here. I can see my air temperature. I can see my wet bulb temperature, and I can see my dry bulb temperature. So why use wet bulb? Because wet bulb really simulates how the leaf uh, feels when you get to a frost event. So it's, you know, the amount of water lost through stomata and the wet bulb as it sounds is a wet bulb, it's wet uh, temperature. So what happens is when the wet bulb gets close to the thresholds, in this case, 33 and a half and freezing, you'll get an SMS warning for that event. And you can see that 
you know, here your air temperature is warmer than your dry bulb. Why is that? Why are they different? Well, the placement. So air temperature is traditionally measured at about a meter and a half or four and a half feet, whereas the frost sensor might be lower to the ground or higher up. So they're not going to be exact. They'll be slightly different. And in fact, there can be quite a difference in temperatures when you're talking about spring frost or fall frost uh, because of radiative cooling. You'll get much uh, cooler temperatures closer to the ground than you will higher up. And it's quite dramatic. So there will be a difference. Then this is the data up to now from the station. Then is the forecast. This is the forecast for wet bulb and air temperature out into the future. So it lets you see how I look in terms of the next period of time uh, for the next frost event. So I have the actual data, what's occurring, I plan for, and then the future of what I need to be paying attention for two days or seven days out as to what will occur. Those are all available to you as well. So that's our extreme uh, weather monitoring tool uh, that looks at very specific, you know, frost conditions where you need to do frost protection using a wet bulb, dry bulb temperature uh, at usually a low area within a uh, vineyard or an orchard uh, to pick up the extreme event. After that, we get into the uh, disease models and there are a lot of disease models that are available. As I said, I switch back to a station where I have them turned on. So here I've got a whole host of different ones turned on for a particular crop uh, and I can pick you know any one that I want. So when you order a model, for example, in wheat, when you when you purchase a wheat model, it's not one model. You can see there's you know 13 different models here, 12 or 13 different models that you can use. Even aphid risk, you know, the fusarium head blight, leaf blotch, all of them. Under soya, if you look at that, there's rust models one and two and a sclerotinia stem rot. If you go under rapes for canola or rapeseed, sclerotinia, pollen beetle. So there's a variety of different models. Uh, each of these models is described uh, in the help section, which is this little question mark over here. So this question mark, when you click it, gives you a kind of a quick summary of how that model is behaving. So each model is, is laid out like that. Uh, and you can use that for any particular one you want to get a quick summary. Also, the cheat sheets that I talked to you about have this in more detail. So they'll help you quickly uh, how to use this or learn how to use it and what the interpretation means. So here we're just looking at the current conditions. Of course, any type of uh, disease risk has to be synchronized with the crop. So the staging is extremely important. So I can always go back in time if I wanted to go back and look at last year. And I know Fusarium generally shows up around Anthesis in my barley or wheat. So I can pick that off and graph that in front of me. And it'll show me then the conditions that occurred. So how, how would I use this? model. So I can see that there was a 100% infection event here. At this point in time, I can see my risk starting to escalate. So right here, if this was very close uh, based on the product that you use and its window of application, near anthesis as an example, I may want to put an application on because now I have an infection event. The actual symptoms are going to show up so many days down the road based on the environmental conditions, temperature, humidity, leaf wetness, precipitation. So I have a 100% infection event. I have increasing risk. So I probably will pull the trigger here if I'm synchronized to uh, the crop in terms of staging. Plus that field has a history of fusarium in it, a long history. So that's an example of using it for uh, fusarium in wheat. And you can use it for any crop. So in potatoes, if I wanted to look at uh, uh, one for potato, late blight, very common disease. We'll pick one that works here. We're getting there. So we go back again in time because it's early in the year here. I'm not going to have too much. So I'll pick June. I'll pick. Uh, through August and refresh and now 
this is a nice model because what it does, it'll lay out in front of you the risk, the daily risk, is plus the spray window. So I can see my disease severity values. Here I have a value of four, very high disease severity. My spray interval, it was recommending was 14 days, but because of that high pressure, it dropped down to five days. Then it dried up a bit, so then it bumps it back up. So these DSZ values, disease severity values, are accumulated over a period of time. So typically here in, in Canada, you know, if you have eight of these values accumulated in a week, you're generally putting on another spray. But each area is unique in the value. The first spray always happens around 15 to 20 DSV values accumulated. And the nice thing is it shows you that, and it also shows you the spray interval and the color coding of the risk and the environmental data driving that uh, actual calculation as well. And again, there's a help menu there uh, for you to read on that particular model. Um, next after that uh, is our soil moisture. So we have a whole section on soil moisture and here now I can look at my ETO, my rain, I can see my soil sensors in front of me by volumetric amount. I can see my uh, volumetric ion content, which is salts, it's expression of fertility, as well as my soil temperature because that's a tri-scan probe. I can view it in different ways, so I can click here and I can say stacked, and it'll draw it from top down, which is a nice perspective, because now you're looking from the top layer down to the deep layer. And I can see all my different uh, volumetric amounts for that, when my precip events occurred, my ion content, and my soil temperature is really warming up here because of spring. So I can see that by picking different ways to view the data in front of me. I can also pick a, you know, a longer period of time. It's always nice to look at soil moisture over a long period of time because then you get a perspective on what the field capacity and refill wilting points are like uh, on, a, on a particular uh, section or sensor uh, within, a, within a probe. So here, if I looked at the stack view for the last 60 days back, I can see, uh, you know, where I had precipitation added. Also, the thaw occurred from the snow melt and where we have been since that period of time. And the same with the temperatures warming. We also have the ability up here, same as before, to export it as a, a file or chart. You can create custom views. So if I said I only want to look at the top four sensors, I can do that. I could say average four. I'm going to do an average calculation for those four sensors and it will go away and draw a new graph that shows me the average of those four sensors in front of me. So I can see that. Now, if I knew, for example, what my full point was, so if I said my full point was 40 volume and my refill point was, let's just do this 28, these are just made up, and I say save, what it'll do is set a chart in front of you uh, that has the color coding. So now this is my refill point. I want to be above that. If I'm in the blues, I'm in saturation. So where I want to keep my water is somewhere in the green here. Now this is just done fictitiously quickly for you to see it, but to know these levels, you work with your CCA or agronomist or metho staff, and they'll help you, you know, define some of the field capacity and refill points for any particular soil but it's knowledge of that soil at that location that's required. It's just a quick run through then on the probe. So then what happens here is when we start talking about more of the, this is more centric to a individual point. So now if we get into looking at it from a farm view, we have what's referred to as farm view or our crop zone. So here you can see uh, a series of farms that I've set up and fields and crop zones. So if I click on this one, I can see that I have a, a crop zone I've defined for a location, and this can be done by drawing it manually or actually importing a GeoJSON file to create it. I have a name for that crop zone. I have the field name and the farm name. The type of crop that's there, canola or rapeseed, my cultivation period that's set up for it, and I've saved that. 
you can see that's the general settings. So now I have other settings that I can use. I can run an Eremet, a water balance calculation. I could run a soil moisture if there's a probe in there. And I can use the yield prediction part of it. So there's three different things under here as well. So if I click on yield prediction, I now, now go to the yield prediction setup. So here I've picked canola, I've picked the sowing date and end date. I have my adjustment for uh, maturity difference in variety. I have my yield expectation difference based on variety. I put in a top end of number of bushels for that field that's occurred. The soil moisture at sowing, the type of soil uh, texture, field capacity wilting point, the device that I'm using for air temperature, so the air temperature doesn't necessarily have to be uh, exactly close to that field because it's not going to vary that much, but if it is, you can use the same one. And then a rain source. Of course, you need the rain source should be very close to that field so you get accurate water going in that field. And the calculation of units I wanted in, bushels per acre. So it says that's my actual available water at sowing. So I've saved all that. And now I go over and look at the actual graph for that. So what it'll do based on those parameters that I put in is set up a graph in front of you based on those characteristics for that field. Now, I could have divided that field up into four zones if I wanted to and have four different graphs. So you can see through the year here, our long-term normal is in gray here and our seasonally adjusted forecast and actual data, so this is all actual data because the year is done, shows that it was above the long-term normal. And in fact, it was predicting out, you know, anywhere from 54 to 69 bushels an acre based on uh, that water that occurred uh, for yield development. Now, this doesn't take into account pests and diseases. We're considering here, you're keeping those all in check. What it is saying is there's so much soil water available, each inch or 25 millimeters of soil water will increase your yield by X bushels an acre per, per crop. So that's essentially, and this will be up to date. So if it was June 27th, that would be our current estimate. And then there'd be a graph out into the future predicting to physiological maturity based off a seasonal adjusted weather forecast. So that's taken to effect you know, El Nino, La Nina, and all the things that are going on. And then the long-term forecast based off of normals as well. So one thing I didn't show you here was that, you know, you can do this currently for barley, maize, rapeseed, or canola, soybeans, wheat, and wheat durum. Those are the crops that we have available. The other that comes bundled with it is the satellite view. So you can actually look at the satellite coverage uh, for that and satellites have a lot of cloud. So the general thumbnail is 75 meter resolution, but when you click on it, it will go down to 10 meter resolution. So NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index, is a good way of expression of yield potential at heading or physiological or at uh, peak vegetative development of a crop. So we can see here that uh, we're at eight to nine uh, in terms of the scale runs from zero to one. We're at 46% uh, of the crop or 27 hectares is at that level at that period of time. So if I want to get peak development, it would be somewhere in about here. So I could look at this image and I could say, okay, where am I at here? So now 93% of the crop, or in other words, it was a great year because we had very high vegetative development, which is an expression of yield. And that did occur because it was a wet year last year. We had a lot of moisture. So with the yield, connect, the yield predictor, it comes bundled with the satellite data as well. And you're able to set up 25 fields or 25 crop zones in the basic type uh, model. The other is the Eremet. I won't go too much into this, but you can really set up, you know, parameterize a crop. You can adjust things like the rooting depth and the staging that occurs, you know, for it when flowering or full happens the amount of efficacy of water into the soil, your different sources of data. Uh, and then you can actually look at that in terms of a water balance. So as I said, there was a great water balance here because it was all positive because we had a lot of water occur. So it gives you the amount of water balance and the maximum water and root depth and the root depth in centimeters. 
If I want that as plant available water, I can do that and look at the drop based on different conditions. When there's recharge, I can see here the uh, rooting depth as it increases with development as well. And where I'm at in terms of overall water status, if I'm saturated or with, I'm within the range. Oh, well, that's nice, it booted me out, eh? So I was getting near the end there anyways, and um, do a quick overview of a lot of solutions uh, that are available for you uh, within field climate. And, you know, again, I want to click on this, that there is a, uh, sorry, there is a, a large value proposition that is available uh, from uh, the tools that are there. So there's a whole set of uh, uh, actionable tools and solutions off of any device, not one. You know, real-time conditions, the alerts, the site-specific hourly forecasting and work planning tools, a whole bunch of crop and insect models that are available, the yield prediction and satellite imagery. There's a whole set of tools for soil moisture, irrigation management, uh, keeping your water within target zones and on track. And those are all broken out kind of in one page or quick examples. And to make it simple to use, we've made cheat sheets that take you step by step through how to use each one of these tools for you. So I think, you know, we're getting near the end. I'm gonna leave some times for questions here uh, on any of these things. So I can, I'll stop there and uh, let you ask uh, some questions if that's all right, or if there's any in the chat as well. Fire away. Nobody's asking questions. Nobody's chatting. Come on, give me one question. Could you show again how to change the units uh, back to inches on field climate? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, just give me a second. I'll share my screen. Thank you very much. Yeah. So go back uh, over here. So in your user, if you go down to user settings, right? If you want all units to be metric or imperial, you switch it here, okay? That'll change absolutely everything. If you don't want to do that, and you only want certain units in certain, uh, certain sensors in certain units, you go under device, you go under sensors and nodes. And in here, if I change this to inches, that now is in inches, whereas other things are in metric. So now I say save that change. And down below, it says it saved that successfully. So if I go back now and look in here, I should see my, I don't have any, oh yeah, here, precip. So precip is in now in inches. 24 one hundredths of an inch occurred as we talked. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That helps a lot. Anything else? Uh, guy hides Sneja. So it's um probably more of a of agronomic question maybe I'm, I'm not sure but you know you you showed a sewing window and there was like maybe 12 or maybe 20 hours of this good sewing window it was all green and then one or three yes. hours red and then again green does it affect for example you start to sew yes. and then 10 hours later a temperature drops um is it better to wait that the you have at least like maybe 48 hours of green good um, sewing window or it doesn't matter once the you know the seed is already in the in the in the ground i mean it, it's pretty forgiving i think if you've got the seed in the you got the seed in the ground um you're okay it's just saying if you're starting out and you had it dropped a little bit it's not critical if it dropped a whole lot 
you know, the problem with that is it's a hard value, right? So if it gets below a threshold, say it's eight, it went to 7.8, now it's marginal. Well, it's not really that bad, right? Uh, you still could sell uh, in that window. It's not affecting it. If you had something like there was a big dump of rain, let's say there was an inch and a half of rain, well, yeah, then that's a critical thing. It's going to take time to dry out for sowing. So it's, you know, it's giving you a, a, an approximation of the sowing conditions. And of course, you've got to feel these, this, these numbers to your particular location and your soil type and your drainage and all that thing. That's all part of it as well. Okay, great. Thanks. I have a question. Can you yes. hear me okay? Okay. Um, yes. Regarding uh, microclimates and build or um, uh, crop model, um, uh, understanding uh, if you do not, if we don't have a um, weather station in the vicinity or in the field, what's your experience with um, the accuracy of the AI or the uh, um, well, the measurements that you'd get or the uh, crop models that you'd get, growth stage models? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, you're asking, okay, I got a field that I don't have data near that field. You know, how accurate is it? Well, you know, from my experience, we've done all kinds of research projects with governments and universities um, that, you know, the difference in microclimate in a particular crop from one under a grass environment. So if you had one under grass, which is the traditional way of measuring weather data at an airport, to under a crop is quite a bit different. In fact, I have examples where they're only a mile apart, roughly, and the microclimate for disease development in that field versus uh, under a grass is no comparison. So it comes down to what I'm saying is it's important to have data at that location to drive a disease type process or irrigation process. If you're talking about temperature, yes, there could be a slight difference in temperature, you know, if you're a mile or two away under flat topography, but it's not gonna be that big. It, yes, there could be, but if you have topographic differences uh, in a valley versus where the temperature is recorded, there will be differences in your overall heat unit calculation or whatever you're using it for. So you have to pay attention to that, the source of the data you're using and really look at where it's placed in relation to what you're looking at, right? And if it's right. a different slopes or elevations, I would be very hesitant to use it because based on what I've seen and looked at various studies, it doesn't take a whole lot to have significant differences in processes like diseases soil moisture or even heat units based on differences of topography elevation slope exposure and so forth so i have a weather station that's been down for only a week all right and it's in onions and um the, i don't know where the nearest state is coming from your end is there a way to find that out um yeah we'd have to go and have a look and you know you send a a station and so forth so we also have a way of creating virtual data for our location uh, based off of all the surrounding data that we have so you know that fills in that gap in that period of time when something's down so there's right. ways to get you to, get to drive it yes so i can find that out okay right thank you yeah i don't know who your who your contact is uh, petra We'll, we'll talk to Petra now. I'll call you after. Anything else? Nobody. I'll ask. With, with all the uh, with all of these tools. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on what you're trying to get, but um, soil moisture has been my most important tool, data points uh, in, in the root zone, um, temperature, and then the um, 
Uh, but I have yet to try to understand how e um, uh, the EC information, how to use that. The volumetric ion content from a yes. SunTech probe? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. There are uh, uh, short documents on that we can give you to get an understanding. But, you know, that is specific for the salts in the, in the soil that naturally occur. And then what you're applying in terms of fertility. So generally speaking, you know, if you if soil moisture goes up, your VIC should go up, should fall. If your soil moisture goes up and your VIC drops, that tends to mean that you're pushing or leaching that deeper, and it should show up in the sensor below. So if soil moisture below isn't going up, and all of a sudden you see an increase in VIC in a sensor below, that means that's where the salts have been pushed or, you know, salts is an expression of fertilizer. That's where they're concentrating. But the numbers are uh, not exact. They're relative to your field. There's no exact index of this number means this. Okay? But So you use it as an index for your field. That really helped. Really did. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, you're welcome. Somebody else is going to ask me. You're going to let me off easy. You just explained everything so well. <laughs> I don't know about that. Thank you, Neja. <laughs> There's lots to cover here. You know, I'm you know I'm ripping through things here. Each one of these things I could spend an hour on in detail. So go back and look at the video. If you need PDFs or any of the cheat sheets, you can ask us as well. I'm just giving you a quick overview of there's a lot of solutions here and want to instill in your mind that there's multiple or stacked ROI for a device uh, that you can use it for. And it should be used like that. I know there's a particular problem that you're trying to solve, but there are many, many things that it can be used for once you have it there. Anybody else? Getting near the end. Um, I guess well, we had a nice else. rain. As I... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I just want to say if nobody has any additional questions, I guess we can uh, stop here. I will send the recording out and um, I can send it together with the cheat sheets, a uh, link to the cheat sheets as well. Um, and of course, the contacts, contacts if anybody needs anything. Um, but yeah, guy, if you want to add for the for the end, some no, no, thank, thank you. For words of wisdom. <laughs> words okay. of wisdom. If you have questions? Uh, fire away to us. We're easy contacting an email or your local rep, and you know I train on this. So if you've got questions, that's what I'm here for. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank You're you all welcome. for joining. Thank you, Guy, for your presentation, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Bye.